Hello, everyone. It's me, Ben, again with uh, Mantis Meet here. Thank you so much for joining us. Uh, I'm really excited. Today, we're going to have a uh, a live stream I've been waiting for a long time. So today, we're going to talk about the ghost mantis, which is probably the favorite mantis species in the entire hobby. And uh, I'm very excited today to have with us today Cora Dart. Uh, just to give a little bit of a, a short uh, background about Cora, she, about, almost three years ago, she was uh, the first person I ever sent a mantis to. And it was my Paris Findel species, or budwing, or tiger mantis, some might call it. Um, so she got it. Uh, she was the person I ever sent uh, a mantis to. And I remember her being, despite being so young, so kind, so helpful. Uh, and I really felt comfortable sending uh, sending my adult mail to her. And then as a, as a thank you, she sent me back this sketch of Jorge, which was the name of my mantis. So, it, you know, I have, Cora has a special place in my heart. I'm very excited to have her here with me. So, uh, Cora, again, welcome. Uh, you know, do you have anything to say to the audience? Um, I'm excited to be here. I ghost mantids are probably my favorite species, and also the species I've kept the most. I've had ghost mantids since I was 13 years old, and my family got them for me as a birthday present. And uh, they're they're my favorite mantis species. Okay, and I and that's why you're here. It's because you have so much experience with them. So. Uh, I, th I don't think I could have picked a better guest. So uh, really quick, do you want to tell us why, like wh what got you into mantises? Uh, I know some of the people here, do, you know, you, you don't need an introduction for a lot of the people here, but for the newer folks who are not, you know, not familiar with you, do you want to just kind of share how you got into the hobby? Yeah. So um, I've always, I mean, I've always loved insects and just all animals, even the stuff that most people would say, ew. <laughs> and uh when I was 10 or 11, I found we were camping um, and my family, we decided to have dinner at the in the pavilion at the campground for some reason. And as we were setting up dinner, this little green thing ran across the table and I had an insect net within four feet for some reason and uh, caught, caught it and realized it was a mantis. I had no clue how to care for it no experience but i wanted to keep it and then after that i was hooked i kept finding more mantids the next summer um i never was able to identify the species or gender of my first mantis mm -hmm. but it started it got me into the hobby then with then i met another friend who also really liked mantids and um we trying to remember exactly how we got into the exotic mantis hobby. But I think she found a website, uh, Mantid Kingdom. Mm -hmm. And pretty sure everybody knows Mantid Kingdom. Yeah, Deshaun and, uh, is great. He's from Mantid Kingdom, yep. Yeah. And so I ordered my first mantids, my first exotic mantids from there. And I was hooked from there. Awesome. Well, yeah, I don't expect you to know, you know, to be able to sex the <laughs> and uh, your first mantis and, uh, and know the species, but that's awesome. And that's one of the things I love about these animals is um, now you've expanded and, you know, it's kind of, you know, from what I've learned, it's growing your interest in other creatures. And that's one of the great things about having mantises. So, uh, so moving on, before I start the presentation, as you guys can see the background, there's a reason why we picked the ghost mantis and today specifically, because uh, we're about to end sp uh, Spooktober here and Halloween is upon us. So thank you for joining us. I think that, I thought it was a very fitting mantis to cover today. So uh, Cora is going to have a presentation that I'm going to share, and we're going to go through it together um, again to cover as much detail, uh, kind of on a general basic level for everybody to know what they need to know about the ghost mantis. Okay, so here we go. You want to take it away, Cora? Yep. And you can just move the next slide. Okay. Yeah. So figured I'd start with taxonomy. The ghost mantis is in Kingdom Animalia because it's an animal. Uh, Phylum Arthropoda, class Insecta, order, order Mantodia. Then I found this interesting. The family that it's in is um, Hymenopodidae, however you pronounce that. I'm probably mm -hmm. pronouncing that wrong. But that's the flower mantis family. And most people don't think of a ghost mantis as a flower mantis, but the way it's classified, it actually is a flower mantis. Then genus, Phylocrania, Paradoxa. Um, and Phylo, in Phylocrania, Phylo means leaf, Crania is head, Paradoxa 
means strange. So that means that literally the ghost mantis is the strange leaf head. <laughs> and it makes sense, right? I mean, when you look at your, your classical mantis, like anybody can look at a classical mantis and be like, oh, that's a praying mantis. But I'm sure you've run into this too, Cora, where people look at my ghost mantis like, what am I looking at? Where's the end? Where's the, where's the back? They can't tell. So it really, I think the name is very fitting, isn't it? Yeah. Yeah. I've had friends who like, I show them a ghost mantis, which is on, that's on a stick with dead leaves on it. And I'm like, find the mantis on here. And if they don't know what they're looking for, they can't find it usually. Yeah. It's, it's definitely a, an effort trying to turn, tell people this is the head, this is the back end. So that's good. Yeah. So, uh, We'll move on to the next slide here. Let's see. Well, actually, with this one, there was one more thing I wanted to mention. Was, sure, go on. Uh, a phenotype of this species is Phylocrania alludens. For some reason, it's classified as another species, but it's been determined that it is only a phenotype of the species. So technically, Phylocrania alludens is just another, another variation of Paradoxa. So they're the same species, but that's often confused and they're often interbred and then people get upset that they're interbred, but they're the same species. Yeah, and that's a great point. Thank you, Cora. I actually forgot about that. But yeah, so the filocranial alludens, again, same thing. Basically, it's just a different phenotype. They can interbreed like Cora mentioned. So uh, one thing that a lot of hobbyists and breeders like to do is not mix the bloodline so that you can maintain those uh, separate phenotypes. Okay, just so, so you know. All right, next slide. Ready, Cora? Yep. Okay. Uh, this slide's probably going to be pretty quick. Most commonly found in Africa, including Madagascar, ghost mantis is uh, one of 880 different species in Africa. And many of these species have, like, share habitat with the ghost mantis. Many of them do not, but um, many of them are spread all over Africa including in the ghost mantids territory. So they will likely in their lifetime come across several other different species of mantids. Yeah. And it's, you know, I would, I would imagine when you look at like other species that kind of cover the same range, like Sphodra mantis, like the African mantis, I would assume it's more likely a Sphodra mantis would just be walking in the wild and walk right by a ghost mantis, not notice, you know, as opposed to the opposite. So their, their mimicry, leaf mimicry is really amazing. Yeah. All right, that's all I have for this slide. Okay, there we go. And for this one, some of these, some of the key morphological features of the ghost mantid seem pretty obvious if you know what you're looking at, but I've had many people not be able to tell what's the head and what's the abdomen. So I wanted to, wanted to show it in this slide. Um, A, as I have marked on here, that's the crown. Um, all ghost mantids will have this, but it looks different between males and females, as I'll go over in the next slide. And uh, B, the head, the, um, that's, I mean, that's pretty self-explanatory. C is, has uh, leaf-like lobes on the leg, which most other species do not. This helps with camouflage because one thing I've noticed when I'm looking for like a Chinese mantis in the wild, the first thing that I notice is the leg because you're not usually going to find just a straight green or brown stick in the middle of a bunch of leaves because usually it'll have other leaves on it but for mantids that's how that's how i usually spot them and i imagine that's how some predators will see them as well so this just helps with the camouflage makes it blend in with other dead leaves uh d is the abdomen and the you can't really see it in this picture, but the ghost mantis abdomen also has lobes on the sides of it, kind of like the legs. And again, this just helps with camouflage, makes it look more like a dead leaf for males. Some females that are going to be green probably look more like live leaves. E is the shield. Not all, not all mantids will have this, but many do. It's on the prothorax, which is the top of the thorax there. And that's just a, um, it's kind of a wide circle, although for some it looks like a triangle, 
Um, it often has jagged edges for the ghost mantis. And again, it's just helping with camouflage. Yeah, and this is why it's so surprising when mantis from the flower mantis family. It's like, that doesn't look like a flower, you know? No, it doesn't. It, yeah, it really throws you off, but it, it is actually from that family. But uh, completely, uh, just beautiful, uh, you know, dead leaf mimicry. I'm surprised it's not called a dead leaf, but still it's 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 a beautiful specimen and a lot of the uh, a lot of keepers and breeders that i talked to if they weren't so easy to breed i think they'd be one of those highly sought after uh rare mantises like that's how beautiful they are yeah for sure they're very they're very unique looking they're one of yeah. if i would consider any mantis species to be an alien <laughs> i think it would be <laughs> i think it would be this species oh yeah that th definitely a top contender i think i would say probably the idolomantis but it is a ghost is definitely a top top contender so okay are you good with this yep okay for this slide um many people who keep ghost mantids want to tell the gender of their ghost mantis and the biggest differentiation between male and female ghosts are the crown so the male crown as i um as you can see in the picture here it's going to be probably usually taller than the female's crown. It'll be thinner and it'll have uh, jagged edges. And one thing I've noticed is that most males will have a more rounded part right where it meets the head. And uh, females don't have this. They usually have a sh slightly shorter crown. It'll usually be a little broader and have smooth edges instead of the jagged edges that the male has. And Another thing that I've noticed in females is they often have a single or sometimes two notches right up at the top. In this picture, she only has one notch. Now, Cora, you know, th there's probably some new people who are going to watch this. How do you tell when a mantis is an adult for sure? You can tell if it's, if it's an adult, if it has wings. Okay. Yep. That's, so that's wings are important. The, yeah. So yeah, that's usually the best way to tell if, for someone who knows what they're looking at, you can tell by looking at um, like the genitals, the abdomen, stuff like that. But the easiest way to tell is the wings. Okay. And how do the adult male and adult female wings differ for the ghost mantis? Um, adult males, their wings are always brown. And uh, they, have, they have a pattern on them that doesn't seem to really differ between females and males. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, there might be a picture of a male's wings Later on in the slideshow, I don't remember. Females, the wings are often the same color as the rest of the mantis. Females can be other colors while males are usually only brown. And uh, they have a pattern on their wings, but it's not quite as, uh, it's not quite as bold as mm -hmm. the males often are. And the male wings are definitely longer uh, yeah. than the female, yeah. yeah. So you'll see, not that doesn't necessarily mean, uh, you know, mostly you'll notice that female mantises, adult mantises, usually their wings tend to typically end at the end of the abdomen, typically. Yeah. Uh, whereas the ghost mantis extends well beyond that. So you can, for, for this species at least, uh, it's pretty easy to differentiate when you look at the wings, the difference between male or female. If you see it, you see the wings pretty much ending at the abdomen, end of the abdomen, then it's a female. If it goes you know, a bit past that, it's, it's a male. So Yeah, and one thing I've you, noticed with, female ghost's wings is on the end of the wing, it'll often bend upwards a little bit. Males don't usually have this. Okay. But that's not that's for every individual. That's yeah. just something I've noticed in some individuals. Now I've noticed with the, the eludens, the, the filicanary mm -hmm. eludens, it's a little bit harder to distinguish with the crowns. Is that Have you experienced that as well? At, at younger instars, especially. Particularly at younger, younger instars, instars, yes, it's more difficult to tell, but as they get older, male eludens will look pretty much exactly like male paradoxa. They might have a little bit of a wider, uh, wider shield, or they might be a little bit bigger. But mm -hmm. generally, in appearance, they look similar to paradoxa males. While females, their crown is—it's just—it's lo it's usually longer and skinny. Mm -hmm. But um, here, actually, I believe I have an eludens female right here that I can show. Oh, okay. That's good. That's that's convenient. This was not planned, by the way, everybody. Well, I promise. Dead, but... <laughs> Come on. She wants to play dead. Well, of course. Oh, that's that's what they're best at. Yes. Oh wow, you can definitely tell. 
Put your hand behind the mantis if you can, the other hand. Yeah, you yeah. Can look at you can definitely you tell go. the so difference. You can, you can tell the difference. A male and male ludens will usually look pretty much just like a female or male. <laughs> no, that's not what I meant oh, to say. She's gone. <laughs> a male ludens will usually look like a male paradoxa, but the female ludens, you can tell their while their crown is longer and skinnier than a than a female paradoxa, it's still smooth around the edges and doesn't have any bend like doesn't really have any bends in it here sorry i should have done this before. yeah this is a better shot so yeah you can that's that's really okay. that's so much cool i don't know i like it when it's longer for some reason it looks really nice yeah it, it yeah. does look really neat is the shield on the illudens wider do you think than the paradoxa or yeah for sure you can okay yeah, you can see that yeah, here yeah. i didn't really show shield of a female paradoxa but she definitely has a wider <laughs> shield and she wants to jump around Okay, yeah, that's so cool. I you actually actually never had a, a Ludens before, so hopefully. Save me one, Cora. <laughs> yeah, I got this guy, uh, this girl and her, some of her sisters from Hawken Carlton, I believe. Okay, I know Hawken, yep, he's a good guy. Yeah, he was downsizing his collection and sent me a bunch of females. Okay, so I think we're good on the sexing. How do you feel about that? Hmm? You, you go with the sexing, the Mantis, is that good? Okay, I think we've talked about it enough. There we go. Ghost Mantis husbandry. For anyone who's kept a mantis before, this is going to seem really basic. Just room temperature, almost any humidity, but you don't want to go too low or too high. Too high can... Um, if there's ventilation, then it's not usually too bad. But if there's not enough ventilation and there's too much humidity in an enclosure, then bacteria or mold can grow. Uh, ghosts do need ventilation, as do pretty much any other mantis species, but I've found they don't really need a ton of space. So up until adulthood, you can use a 32 ounce container, which um, it's just a general size container. I mean, I don't know how to explain it. Actually, here's one. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> pretty much every mantis keeper has one of these. Or hundreds. Um, <laughs> so yeah, from L1 when they're when they first hatch up until adulthood, you can use a 32 ounce container. Although I usually start my smaller nymphs in slightly smaller containers because it's easier to manage feeding that way and storage. But um, once they're adult, some smaller adults can be kept in a 32 ounce container. Others will need larger and that's just minimum. Any instar can have a larger enclosure as long as they're getting their prey. Yeah, and then, so one thing uh, I want to cover real quick because obviously we, every, most people who've been in for a little bit know ghost mantis is the easiest mantis to keep. However, uh, even when they're when, like like any species, usually what I found out for the vast majority of mantis species, when they're young nymphs, it doesn't matter what species it is, they can desiccate very easily, so they can dry, dry out. So it's make sure that they're drinking a lot when they're younger. That, again, yes. doesn't mean you have to douse them in water, but make sure that they're drinking often, especially at first instar. Yeah, but while while you want to make sure they're drinking, you also want to make sure there's not big water droplets that they can drown in because I've had that happen before with yeah. very small mantids. A tiny water droplet seems like a huge pool to them and they yeah. can't get out of it. So and first instar or ghosts are, are kind of small, so you know that that definitely yeah. is a uh, possibility. So I've got yeah, one right absolutely. here. I don't know if my camera will show it, but that's a first instar ghost mantis. Yep, tiny little baby. Look at it. They're they're uh, so cute. Though. They're one of the cutest that, babies. Well, female Aludens. This I believe is one of her babies. Oh. So you can see how they go from being so tiny to so big. Yeah, and I I would say the ghost mantis is the perfect beginner mantis. Uh, because yes. because of the size, you don't have to worry about something too small where you can't see it when it grows older, or something so big you have to get a really big uh, enclosure. Again, like you said, thirty-two ounce container, pretty much its entire life. I mean, that yeah. you can't beat that. It's super easy. Yeah, they're right. they're pretty yeah. much they're easy in pretty much every single way, except they can be picky eaters, which is why I yeah. saved this for last on here on this slide. They will eat almost anything but they prefer things that move a lot, things that fly. And they do not do well when they're hand fed or they, 
most individuals don't like being hand fed. Some of the, some, like I feed mainly roaches, which are hard, they're, they can be hard to just drop in the enclosure and expect the mantis to catch it because I have dubias and they don't run very much. They just try to find a place to hide. So if you're going to just drop the prey in the enclosure, if it's some, if it's a mealworm or a roach or something that will try to hide, you want to make sure there's not substrate or too much in the way that it can hide behind before the mantis finds it. But I've I've found that some some of my ghosts are less picky. They'll just go right after the roach the minute I drop it in. Others will not, and so I have to hand feed. Usually I do that by like because they're picky they don't like to be hand fed they don't like stuff being shoved in their face the the way i usually do it is if you gently blow on the face of the mantis and then hold and then quickly put the uh, put the prey item with i mean usually you have to tear it open a little bit to make it taste good to the mantis you just put that goo or the guts up to the mantis's mouth and then mantis will taste it, realize it's food, and then sometimes, most of the time, eventually it'll take it from you, but I do have some picky females that want me to hold it for them the entire time they're eating. <laughs> and so, yeah, that, I have actually a small hypothesis here. We're usually, when we look at mantises that rely heavily on camouflage, like the ghost mantis or the, the deroplatus, which is the dead leaf uh, genus, uh, they tend to be pretty shy or not necessarily shy but they're 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 easily spooked so yeah. the man the ghost mantis falls into that so if you are taking a ghost mantis out of its enclosure you're disturbing it kind of you know and then if you want to tongue feed it where you're kind of shoving a a you know a prey item in its face it's going to be a little apprehensive that's that's normal whereas if you do that with a herodula or a sphodra mantis they'll go after it very willingly so you oh, know, yeah. that that's a for me that's a good general rule of thumb if you see a mantis that is you know that does it trying to mimic some kind of leaf or something uh, it means they don't want to be seen so if they're like oh my gosh i'm i'm seen they're gonna freak out a little bit and they, that's why they won't be as uh, uh open to eating so that's why when i feed my ghosts i just toss a prey item in there in their enclosure mm -hmm. and they'll they'll catch it eventually uh cora mentioned to me earlier you definitely want to try especially if you have something like dubias that like to burrow if you have a ghost mantis in an enclosure that has substrate you probably don't want to do that. Uh, it's usually better for enclosures where the ghost mantis can easily see the prey at them, something with maybe a paper towel bottom or something like that. So just keep yeah, it in mind when you're feeding the ghost mantis. Yeah. The roaches will like to hide in them. So if you're going to just drop a roach in, then I recommend having a separate feeding container. You can transfer the mantis to the feeding container, let it get used to that for a few minutes, and then put in the prey item. So then you're not disturbing it so much when you're putting in the prey. And it'll still, like, it'll be comfortable in its environment. But yeah, going off of your hypothesis there, that's probably also the reason why ghosts will play dead as soon as they're disturbed, like that mm -hmm. Ludens female just did. Yep. Just, it's kind of ironic that ghost mantids are the ones that are easily spooked. <laughs> <laughs> yep. That's, again, perfect theme for this live stream at this time, right? Seriously, yeah. Yeah. And then uh, one more thing uh, to come. on when you're using something like uh, i use yeah, crickets often so using you, can you hear me yeah, yeah we're you're back good. okay sorry <laughs> there's always some kind of technical difficulty during the stream okay so what i was trying to say sorry is that if you do choose to feed your ghost mantis the way i do for example which is just drop the prey item depending on what prey item you're using i, I mean let me just backtrack. It's better to take out any prey item if you think the mantis is about to molt. Okay, so especially with crickets and some roaches, they can be a little bit uh, protein hungry. So, and then when the mantis molts, it's very uh, vulnerable. So keep that in mind. Uh, I, I would even take big flies out because it can technically knock a mantis down that's that's molting. It wouldn't eat it or anything per se. But yeah, I've, uh, I've had that, that happen mind. before too. Yeah, it's yeah, it's very rare to be honest. I've I mean, I, I keep I throw in crickets with the vast majority of my mantises, and I've had very, very few instances where they eat the a multi mantis. It happens, but it's to me, it's not a big deal. But for somebody who keeps five mantises, that's all you got. 
for somebody yeah. who has hundreds, I just don't have the time to do that. So, but yeah, absolutely good point. Okay, you ready to move on to the next slide? Yep. Okay. So with this one, I just, I wanna introduce the topic of communal setups because this is one of the more controversial topics when it comes to ghost mantids. There are pros and cons to keeping communal setups. Pros, as I have on the slide, they can be a cool display piece if you set up a really cool tank with a bunch of ghost mantids in it. It can look really cool. You don't have to feed them individually because then you can just throw in food and not have to open individual containers every time you want to feed. And that is especially nice if you have a lot of mantids because it's very time consuming to individually feed. And it also saves space because you don't have a whole bunch of different containers. They're all in one container. But the cons to like the cons to communal keeping is some people want to keep track of the individual project progress in their mantids. Like when did this mantis last molt or which one needs to eat now? That kind of stuff. It's harder to keep track of them individually if you have them all in together. And because they're all in together, there's a risk of cannibalism, which means you have to put in more food and you have to feed more frequently to make sure they're well fed and also to make sure that they're getting food. Because if you're just throwing food in there, there's no guarantee that they're all going to get food or all going to find food, especially if there's a larger container. And then again, with what you said about the fly, how the fly can knock down a mantis while it's molting, a, another mantis, if you keep them communally, can also do that or they will attack and cannibalize their molt another molting mantis because that's when they're at their most vulnerable. Yeah, and then, uh, I mean, generally speaking, whenever I talk uh, about communal setups or anybody asks me, I think there's a good golden rule to go by is when somebody asks you or me, should you keep or can you keep mantises communally? The golden answer is if you're willing to lose some. And, and that's, yeah. you know... That doesn't mean you always will or or you know or it won't happen but it's it's a possibility and you know cora can tell you or anybody else who's kept a uh, uh, mantis community sometimes all it takes is one murderous individual okay so you can have a group and then you just have one ravenous female she just starts chomping on anybody that comes near her. so uh you know just just be mindful of that when you're when you're keeping them communal so do you yeah, have any despair? Also, any, yeah, go on. Yeah, Sorry. Females, especially older instar females, can be a lot more ravenous than the males. And so if you're going to keep them communally, I don't suggest keeping males and females in the same enclosure. Males are more, at least later instar males, are more likely to do well communally than females because females, they're just eat, 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 eat. But males hardly eat anything into adulthood. Yeah, and, and with the with the ghost mantis, again, like you said, especially the females, like you'll feed it a big fat roach, and then you come back the next day, it's like why is why is the abdomen so flat? Where do they all go? You know, so they're they can actually exactly. eat quite I a bit. Just, the ghost. I was just doing that about five minutes before we got on the live stream. I looked at one of my ghost females that I just fed two days ago, and I'm like, did you lay an ooth or something? Because <laughs> yeah, there, there's no way you just ate a big roach, but. Nope, yeah, I mean, they're, like their abdomens, you can see right after they eat, they get big. But then like a day later, it's like, geez, I guess yeah. it's digested it all just quick. So, yeah, just keep that in mind, everybody, for the communal. Uh, so like Cora mentioned, uh, you know, separate by sexes is also good. Also by instar. So I think yeah. it's, it makes sense if you have a sub-adult ghost mantis and a third instar or fourth instar. It's the size difference is huge. So it can see it as a tiny little morsel, something easy to eat. So just keep that in mind moving forward. Right, and then here you go. Yeah, so if you're going to do a communal setup, there are several things that you want to keep in mind. Probably a few more things that I should have added on here, like keep them with same instar or same size um, other individuals. But you want to make sure they have lots of space because you don't want them on. You don't want them literally on top of each other because that's just going to increase the risk of cannibalism if one mantis looks around and all it sees is mo moving other mantids because they're attracted to things that move for prey. So if they aren't well spread out, if they don't have room to spread out in the cage, then they're much more likely to, they're much more likely to cannibalize. You want to make sure you have a consistent food supply because if 
you it, like if you miss a day of feeding or whatever or you don't put in enough food then there again is a risk of cannibalism that's cannibalism is the biggest issue in communal setups so you're pretty much doing everything to prevent cannibalism consist i say consistent food supply because you can have a whole lot of fly pupae but those are going to run out and if you don't have a way to get more then you're going to have hungry mantids all in one cage together you want to make sure that you always know that you're getting more food so that you don't run out because while a single mantis in its own enclosure can last a little bit longer without food a hungry mantis around other hungry mantids is much more likely to cannibalize you want to make sure you have supervision again for the risk of cannibalism because uh, if you see all of your mantids gathered together in one corner of the giant 10 gallon tank then you probably want to go in and make sh and spread them out a little bit because you don't want them all on top of each other you want to look out for cannibalism if you see a particularly cannibalistic mantis you probably want to separate that one from the rest and you can usually tell which one it is because one will have a very fat abdomen while the other ones will not. <laughs> so if you notice a mantis missing in your communal setup, you, it's pretty easy to tell who the culprit is. And then not, not this one's not to prevent cannibalism quite so much, but you just want to make sure there's plenty of places for molting because if they're all trying to molt from the same spot, then one could knock another down. And that and that's just not good. You don't you don't want every everyone to be piled on top of each other because you could have a giant cage, but if you only have one stick in the big cage, then they're all gonna be molting from that stick. And uh I mean those are all great points, Cora, and I, I cannot emphasize enough on the consistent food supply. Because you have to remember there's multiple mantises in, in there. They're gonna be hungry at different times. And usually when I notice cannibalism in my communal setup, it's because I skipped the day or forgot to throw in feeders. So you got to think about it. You always have to account for a hungry mantis. If there's always feeders buzzing around or crawling around in there, there's an opportunity for them to eat something that's not uh, a ma another mantis. Okay. So yeah, especially if you good. have active, like very active prey, like blue bottle flies, house flies, something like that, because a mantis is going to be much more likely to go for one of those than another ghost mantis that hardly ever moves. Yeah. So, yeah. So you got, you know, that helps also the size difference. So a mantis, uh, they know another mantis is potentially a risky meal. So obviously if they see something like a fly, that's better for them. So make sure you keep that in mind as well. Uh, supervision is important too. Uh, like Cora said, <laughs> there are times where in the Camille setup, I'll hop in and then I'll see like, wow, that one was a lot close, uh, was a lot further and is a lot, a lot closer to its smaller sibling now. So sometimes you can spot that ahead of time. Uh, if you've kept, kept enough mantises, you can tell when they have that kind of like, oh, I'm hungry uh, gaze going on and they'll go after the prey. So you can move it in case you see that so that you can prevent further cannibalism. Uh, and then also for the last one, the planning spaces of molting uh, for molting. People sometimes underestimate what adding extra purchase to your enclosure can do. It doesn't matter how big your enclosure is sometimes, like, like Cora said. If there's nothing in there and they're all hanging out at the very top, they're closer to each other. They're in, they're in close proximity. So you're going to increase the chances of them munching on, on each other, climbing each other when they're trying to molt, all that kind of stuff. So add perches, leaves, sticks, all kinds of stuff. Uh, and as you're adding them, try to make sure that they have space below each perch so that a mantis can molt. Yeah, and I just want to add to that, as a rule for any mantis cage, whether it's a communal cage or individual setup, you want to make sure that you're minimizing the risky molting spots because the rule of thumb is the mantis will always find the worst spot to molt and so you just want to be prepared for that make sure that there are no bad spots for it to molt from so that you're not dealing with a potential mismolt. molt great point cora great point all right next slide this is the i think this is why a lot of people are here and i'm so excited to uh to see you so i just want to say also before we start cora forgive me Big kudos to you for probably seeing this question come up a million times on the probably the Mantid forum from back in the day uh, on the Facebook groups and then 
you know, I have so much respect for you for going, you know what, I'm going to find out. And you, you organize it all by yourself. Uh, you, you know, you, you got the right funding and resources. And this is a very time, uh, you know, a time intensive, uh, you know, process. So, you know, discovering and learning science, it takes time to learn these kind of things. So as before we go into this, I just say I'm so proud of you, Cora. And, uh, you know, I support you. So many of the community members support you for doing this. Uh, so again, thank you so much. So, but yeah, let's go ahead. Uh, let's go ahead and talk about your thing here. Yeah. So just to introduce this experiment, one of the, one of the biggest asked questions about ghost mantids is what influences the color of the ghost mantis. There's so many different theories. Many of them are treated as truths, but none of them have been proven as I've, I mean, I've researched it. I can't find any, anywhere that somebody has proved that say it's higher humidity that causes a female to turn green. But then I've also seen communal setups where a whole bunch of nymphs are kept in the same setup with the same, same humidity, same environmental colors, everything, but they all end up different colors. And so I, I wanted to answer this question, what causes the different colors? And I mean, I, I've always been interested in it, but the reason I decided to do this experiment was actually because I got into a conversation that kind of turned into an argument with someone on, um, I think it was a Discord group, Discord Mantis chat, and we were talking about the, like, what causes the ghost colors, and I said, in the heat of the moment, I'm like, you know what? maybe for my next science fair or something, I'll just, I'll do a project and try to prove this. And then I thought about it and realized the science fair project is, that's going to be kind of small, but I have the potential to do something bigger with this. And so I decided to, decided to see what I could do with that experiment. <clears throat> so I started the experiment last year and I, th I thought that I was going to be able to do it just fine last year, but then over this past summer, I ran into a problem where my fruit fly cultures were all failing for some reason. Then there, then there was a mite takeover that, that was kind of hard to avoid. And then there must have been a fungus, bacteria, or something, because then even full, fat, healthy nymphs that were kept in perfectly good enclosures were just dropping dead by the dozens. And so unfortunately, I kind of had to restart the experiment. I kind of consolidated a little bit, got rid of a few uh, a few factors that I was going to test because I realized that those are probably not, like most people don't consider some of those factors, like whether they're kept in a light environment or a dark environment, stuff like that. Most people don't consider those factors and that would just that would be so many more nymphs because i'm trying to get 30 nymphs per setup per um 30 nymphs per um per environmental factor that i'm testing and so that would have been a lot of mantids and between schoolwork and th living the rest of my life i didn't want to be dragged down by having to feed so many mantids every single day or every other day. So I kind of consolidated it to be to where it would be a little bit more manageable for me, but I still think I'm going to be able to answer or at least get further in answering this question. So the goal of my experiment is to determine the factors that influence the color of a ghost mantis. Um, my hypothesis is that if different groups of ghost mantids are exposed to different environmental factors, their colors will not be affected by those factors. The reason I say this is because, bringing up my point from earlier, you see a whole bunch of nymphs kept in a communal setup, but they all turn out to be different colors. If they're all kept in the same environment with the same colors, the same factors, why do they turn out to be all those different colors? <coughs> And so many people will say that a green environment is going to make them turn green or a, uh, an environment with high humidity will make them turn green. For some reason, green is the most sought after color of ghost mantis, but it's also 
one of the more rare colors. It, while it's it's not super rare, but it's also not nearly as common as brown and different shades of brown. So I believe that the um, that it's a genetic thing that determines the different the different colors that a mantis will be, but I I don't have any proof for that. So that's why I'm doing this experiment to test the different environmental factors that everyone says that like some people really believe that a, it's a high humidity environment that is going to affect it. And so I'm testing a high humidity environment. I'm actually, you can go to the next slide where I have all this laid out. Yeah, so I've got four experimental groups. There are 30 nymphs in each group. Well, or there will be 30 nymphs in each group. Right now I'm still getting up to that number. I have about half the amount that I need, but I've got several oots incubating fertile females and a couple oots coming in the mail next week. Um, so my four groups are, I have the control group, which this each nymph, every nymph in my experiment is kept in an individual cage so I can keep track of the individual progress. Uh, the control group is kept in, each nymph is kept in, a cage that is kept at room temperature, room humidity, like I, I don't do anything to higher or lower that the humidity. And there's there are no other colors in the cage except the white paper towel. And then I have a high humidity environment where there's no extra colors in the cage or surrounding the cage. It's just the only factor that I changed there is that there's high humidity instead of room temperature humidity. Then I have green environment and brown environment, both like I, I'll put sticks in the brown cages and then green, I'll, um, I don't have any in there at the moment, but I plan to put fake leaves on the sides of the containers. And then there's a green, um, there's green fabric on the lid. Those are kept at room temperature, room humidity. So the only factor that's changing with those is the color. So that's to test the three or the the two or three most common um, most common opinions or hypotheses that influence the color of the ghost mantis. Can't hear you, Ben. I can't hear you. Okay, how about now? You're good. Okay. <laughs> Sorry about that. Again, I just literally switched to a different input. Oh, I was talking there for a second. So what I was trying to say, sorry, was that the cool thing is, you know, I mean, let's look at the two possible uh, conclusions of this experiment. Like, imagine you can control to a degree what color the mantis could come out to. You know what I mean? That'd be really, that's, that's a whole other uh, dimension to the hobby you'd be adding. You know, just a whole, a whole other type of activity you can do and talk about. So it's very exciting. And even on the other spectrum, we can at least, you know, be like, finally, Cora concluded after a long, you know, uh, tedious study that it is genetic, you know, at least until another study comes out, right? Because that's how it works. So I'd, I'd be happy for both conclusions, to be honest. So I'm, yeah. again, I'm very excited that you're doing this. So thank you so much. Uh, you, so is it was a website in the next slide or? Oh, I might have. I might have forgotten to put the website on there. I think I took it off. Good, because what I'm going to do, Cora, is I'm, because I love this that you're doing this, I'm going to make a separate post later. Uh, I'm going to link your site. Uh, for anybody watching, please keep your eyes open for that. Follow the site or uh, uh, bookmark it. Do you have a Do you have like an email list on there? Um, it's a It's a WordPress blog, so I think there's a way to subscribe to it. Okay, so that'd be great too. If you know, maybe Cora can set that up. Make sure it's there. But if you can't subscribe, 
Uh, Cora is also every once in a while she'll post in the in the Mantis Meet group that she needs help with something concerning her experiment. Uh, she's always welcome to do that. So you know we she could use all. Sometimes like she mentioned, she had that massive die off of uh, nymphs, uh, the fruit fly crash, which uh, as longtime keepers will tell you is is unfortunately more common than we wish. It's so more it, it can, and unavoidable. Yeah, it is. It, to predict it. It absolutely sucks. I've been there. Trust me. So, and you just you're scrambling for fruit flies at the last second. So, uh, keep your eye out for you know for Cora in her experiment. If she's out there asking for her help, if you could provide that, that'd be fantastic. So, uh, again, Cora, thank you so much. You know, it's awesome. Uh, but now, unless you have anything else to go over for the uh, uh, experiment, we can we can go into Q and A. How do you feel about that? That's fine. That's All right, I've guys. Got. So, let's go ahead I and uh, see comments. By the way. You can't see I'll comments. Try to okay. Pull them up on my phone, but I can't. There you go. See them I'll, like yeah, worst case, I'll read them out to you. Not a big deal. Uh, let's put it up here. So, put in your questions in the chat, and I, and I can read them out to Cora. Not a big deal. Uh, you know, and then obviously you guys can ask whatever you want. But this is a Ghost Mantis stream, so let's start with that. At least, does anybody have any questions regarding uh, Ghost Mantises or care? Uh, you know, what's the best enclosure for them? Blah blah blah. So. Okay. Okay. Someone said, "You personally think color of parents might play a role in the color of the nymphs?" And yes, if it is genetic, then likely the color of the parents, or at least the, mainly the color of the mother, will play a role in it. But that's assuming it's genetic, and I have to prove one way or another. I have to prove that it's either not genetics that it's a controlled environmental factor or that it is genetics and if it is genetics then i will then i do plan to go from there do it i'll probably do a whole other experiment in that case to try to find a, a bloodline find or breed a bloodline of mantids that is all or ma majority one color and i'm sure many yeah. other breeders will do that if i can show that uh that it is genetics or that it's likely genetics that determines the color. I think uh, Christopher Hannon uh, has a good question here. I wonder if time of year will influence that as well as when the ooth hatches. And uh, I can't speak for the color. That's that's kind of a that's a good question. If you look at the range from where uh, the ghost mantises come from, uh, which is, uh, you know, below the Sahara and mm -hmm. really all the way down to South Africa, I, they don't have that much of a wild change in temperatures during the year. So I don't know if it does. I know for, I, I don't know, but I suspect for other species. Uh, so one thing, for example, here in Florida, when it gets toward the end of the, you know, the season, uh, you can notice sometimes more males and females, and that might be an influence, but I don't know if, uh, I mean, Cora, what can you say to that? Um, what I can say to that is in captivity, which I'm not focusing on wild mantids for this, I'm just focusing on the captive hobby because there's not really a way for me to go out and study wild mantids. So I'm, I'm only focusing on the mantids that are in the hobby right now. And in the hobby, there mantids that are kept in captivity, they're not going to experience temperature changes. They're not going to experience really humidity changes, that kind of stuff, because the mantis keepers or breeders will will try to keep those factors at um at the same at the same level at the same rate just because there's no no reason for that to change so yeah. i don't think that a time of year could really even possibly play a role in it because they're with captive mantids we're not seeing or most captive mantids are not going to experience a change in temperature or humidity that kind of stuff and that would be the that would be the factor there because there's not really a way for a captive mantis to follow the same seasons that it would in the wild if they follow a season there because they're kept they're if they're kept in captivity captivity they're not going to know what's going on in their native habitat yeah, and get, that's I, I feel like that would be a separate experiment almost. You know what I mean? Yeah, uh, not one that I would be able to do. 
Yeah, and then also some other factors that might influence it that people don't really think about is things like barometric pressure and things like that. So I know some uh, some experienced breeders who are trying to look into that more. They're not doing experiments, so to say, but they're trying to, based on their observations, see if, if there's anything they can make of that. Um, one earlier question, Cora, and I can't, I'm sorry, I can't see the username here, but uh, it's scientifically, what's the point of different crowns? Like, why is there a difference between crowns? You know, so... Different, why is there a difference between the crowns? Yeah, I don't, I don't know if there is, to be honest. Uh, like the different shape of the crowns of the male and female uh, ghost mantis. Yeah, that's that's probably just that. That's just how they're they are genetically. That's um, that's very obviously a genetic thing because, um, and it's a sex linked tra sex linked trait. The different crowns. Because I've yeah. never seen a female with a male crown, and I've never seen a male with a female crown. Yeah, I, I would say the point was uh, for us to sex them more easily. Let's just say that's the evolutionary reason. So, <laughs> <laughs> so uh, let's see what else we got here. What are the questions? Uh, so somebody wants to know how many ghosts you have or that you plan to use for your experiment. I think you already mentioned, right? You said thirty in four different 30 factors. Per group. I have four different groups, so that's one hundred and twenty mantids. Okay. Okay. And then uh, Isaac asked, why did they name them uh, the ghost mantids from their appearance? It would make sense. They would be nicknamed something regarding fall time leaves. Uh, I mean, that's, that's a good question. What do you think, Cora? Um, I'm trying to remember. I think I knew at one point who started calling them ghost mantids, but I believe that it was because dead leaf mantids had a common name, had their common name first. Otherwise there's no reason ghosts would not be called dead leaves dead leaf mantids and i think it's just because of their cryptic appearance sorry you cut out there a little bit what did you say cora um i said that um it's probably just because of their cryptic appearance and from what i've heard dead leaf mantids had their common name first because otherwise ghost mantids would have the common name dead leaf mantis because there's not really a reason that they wouldn't yeah yeah that's a good point point. and you know i mean if you want to when you think about common names so there i'm not going to go into too much detail here because this is not the uh place and time for it kind of but common names have a use you know despite the you know uh, uh, chagrin of others but it's it's to get people into the hobby nobody look if you want somebody to join the hobby and you tell them hey you have to call this phylocranial paradox all the time kiss that person goodbye they're not coming back so the point of the yeah. common names is to kind of give the mantis some kind of fun way to, to identify it or uh, talk about it, get people into the hobby, get interested. Uh, you know, and if you really want to think about the, you know, the name ghosts, it's, you know, they're hard, you don't see a ghost, so to say, or they're hard to see. So is the, uh, so is the ghost mantis. So that's another way you can look at it. They play dead. So maybe the ghost arises after, I don't know. So it's just, <laughs> you can come up with anything you want. Ghost mantis is not too bad of a common name in my opinion. Uh, so, yeah. Yeah. And it, yeah. it describes the species pretty well. Yeah, so I, I I would I'm okay like I would stick with ghosts that's fine with me. Uh, let's see here. So another question is from Renee. Is it okay to keep just one mantis? In other words, would it be cruel to be keeping it from its purpose in life? Uh, I guess many keepers no. keep just one mantis. <laughs> yeah, I mean you, you got to think about it. Its purpose is to entertain us. No matter how you want to look at it, these are all cap. Most of them are captive bred. They're it's a hobby. So you are bringing it in for you to observe and you know enjoy and stuff. So its purpose is really for you. If if you don't believe in that, then you shouldn't be keeping mantises. I don't know how else to put it. So is it wrong? No, absolutely not. Uh, I personally, and you know, this is a this is a this is just shows how the hobby. Many people engage in the hobby in different ways. For example, I don't necessarily see go, like mantises as pets. To me, they're like beautiful animals or specimens. I keep them to observe and and propagate and stuff. Other people see them like pets, the same exact way you see a dog. Again, I don't see it that way, but there's nothing wrong if you do. So if you see it as something like a dog, for instance, uh, again, they're two different animals. You know, don't conflate them. But if you have that type of connection or emotional attachment to, to your mantis, no, there's nothing wrong with that at, at all. What we do encourage people to do is in the event, especially if it's a rarer species, is to we encourage people to maybe seek out others who want to uh, uh, get into a breeding collaboration to help, you know, push that species forward and keep them in the hobby. Again, I don't believe yeah, it's that's unethical. That's not keeping the mantis from its pers like purpose in life. That's just 
keeping it in the hobby, keeping the species in the hobby. But ghost mantids are not leaving the hobby anytime soon. Yeah. They're probably <laughs> one of the most common species kept in the hobby. So mm -hmm. no, it's not it's not wrong to keep just one mantis. Yeah, and I agree. I think that's that's we can tie it up on that one. Uh, we got a question from uh, from Lisa, a moderator. Uh, she hears that room temperature for ghosts is fine, uh, but do you f what do you feel is the best temperature for ghosts? So since your contr control group is also room temps, uh, blah, blah, blah. yeah. So um, let's just stick with that. What what do you think are the best temps? Um, I generally stick with room temperature between. I mean, I forget what I put on my slide earlier, but anywhere between like 67, 68 and like 85 to 89, that like, that's a good range for the ghost mantis. I usually keep mine between 70 and 80 degrees. So for, for, the, for those in Europe, or I should say for the rest of the world, really just outside of the US, it's about 20 Celsius. And usually 67, that's on the lower end. That's okay for night time, night temps. Yes. That's okay. Uh, but, you know, what do you say up to 70, 80, you said? 78, 80? Between 70 and 80 degrees. Okay. And then 80 degrees Fahrenheit is about 26 Celsius. So that's a good range. Again, as we mentioned earlier, I really believe the ghost mantis has the widest range of temps that it can, it can tolerate. Okay. So I guess... Whatever you again, if you're comfortable living in a in us, you know, an Eskimo or something, you know, if you're comfortable with the, with the room temps, your ghost will be fine. You can follow the general rule of temperature. So, if you want your gross, ghost mantis to grow faster, you can bump up the temps, you know, feed more or whatever. If you want to slow down your mantis growth, you can keep them a little bit cooler. So, but yeah. uh, one thing I can definitely tell everybody I feel the best thing for a mantis, in my opinion, based on my observations and experience, is a, a, temp, a temp differential. So during the day, let's say it's 75 degrees Fahrenheit or whatever, and then at night it dips down to 70, 68. I think that's good for a mantis. So again, the range is it, it's a that's why they're one of the hardiest mantis species is because they can uh, live very comfortably within that wide range. So thank you, Lisa, for that for that question. Uh, next question comes from Ashley. Do you think uh, any particular colors are more rare in ghosts? Uh, would you be willing to note the colors as you go through the experiment and share the percentage of each color at the end? Yeah, so that's definitely a part that um, I'm, that's definitely something I'm going to do with the experiment. I think I need to do that to prove that my results, whatever they are, are statistically significant. Um, but I believe green and gold are probably more, some of the more rare colors in ghosts. In a general line of ghosts, you also wouldn't see many black individuals, but um, but from what I've seen and heard from other people, if you're breeding a black male and a black female, you're most likely to get black offspring almost exclusively. So I would say green and black are probably the most, or the least common, the most rare. Yeah, no. Um... Yeah, green, yeah, and black, like you said. I do see a lot of tan, a lot of brown. So I think yeah. that, that kind of checks out. And that's uh, Rigitte, for females, really. Males, yeah, for you females, you're see, right. Yeah, you don't see green males, or if you do see green males, they're only green up until the adult stage. Mm -hmm. And an adult male that there, I've seen some people showing their adult males that have a greenish tint to them. But I wouldn't none that I would consider to be completely green. Um, yeah, yeah. Only females can be green. Males can be any shade of brown or black, but only females can be green. Sometimes they even get a, like a silver tint to them. The males they have like a cool yeah. silvery sheen yeah. on their wings. It's really again, it's such a fascinating creature that they even have this different range of colors. Um, next question, uh, one, again another moderator from our group here, uh, Rigitze. Could the environment the female laid the Uthika in play a part in their colors? Humidity, temp, uh, so something like that. Um, it's possible, but I, I wouldn't think so because the uh, one Uth, the nymphs from one hatch can turn out to be many different colors, even if they're kept in the same environment. Um, some might be more one color than another, it's like they're more likely to be more brown individuals than a green in, than green individuals in most cases, but um, 
but no, I, I mean, that'll be hard for you. They'll be hard for you to factor in because you've, uh, you know, you've been sent these oaths too. So you don't know exact well, conditions. The majority, they've been kept of, in. the majority of the oaths that I've used in this experiment so far have been laid by fertile females that Hawkins sent me. So they have, all of these oaths have been laid in um, with the mantis in my care. All of the females have almost identical enclosures. Okay. Yeah, it's again. I feel like that would be the you know separate uh, experiment almost to to gauge, and that just shows why this whole process of learning and discovery is hard and time consuming, and you have, yeah, there's a lot of stuff involved. So, which is why you know I'm glad she's kind of focused down a little bit uh, to see at least in terms of nymph growth if that has an effect. So, uh, next question was Lynn. She asked, "What part of Africa are the ghosts from?" Um, Cora showed a slide earlier. It basically is south of the Sahara. All the way down Africa and Madagascar. Uh, if you once this uh, uh, stream is over, you can rewind back to the earlier part, and you can. There's a little map you can see there. Uh, okay, I think Wesley says uh, thank you for doing this, and you know, again, we we all think we're very proud of Cora. Uh, Jose, if you buy one mantis, you want more. That's usually how it goes, right? So I agree, one hundred percent. There, yeah, absolutely. Uh, okay, so I think that's it for the questions, um, and then. I think that's perfect timing. We're finishing right about an hour. Yeah. Um, Cora, do you have anything else to say for for the group and, and you know fellow community members? Um, thank you to everyone who's supported me in in the hobby and in this experiment. I'm one of the youngest hobby members. Um, I'm only sixteen, and um, I've I've never been not welcomed by people in this hobby. Even even when I was a very much so a beginner in the hobby, I was treated with kindness, and I just I just want to thank everyone that I've learned from and that I will continue to learn from. Thank you to everyone who supported me in the hobby and allowed me to get to the spot where I am in the hobby right now. And also thank you to everyone who's supporting and following my experiment. Um, and thank you, Jax, for inviting me on this live stream. <laughs> Awesome, thank you for uh, for coming again. Like I said, I couldn't think of a uh, of a better person to bring on to talk about the ghost mantis. So thank you for your time. Thank you to all of you who watched. Uh, thank you for the future watchers who will be watching this because it's going to be available up to see later. Uh, you know, keep being awesome. Like Cora said, our community is awesome, and that's one of the reasons why I'm still in it and why I'm so heavily invested in it. Is as much as I love the mantises, I I love our community members as well. So we're having a lot of fun, having a lot of good time, learning and, and sharing our. Experience. Our experiences with others so that's all i gotta say thanks again for another live stream uh there's gonna be more live streams coming so as usual uh pay attention to the feed uh and uh, kind of see what we're doing and keep you know things on your calendars for, for upcoming live streams and whatnot but that's all i got thank you so much and uh, have a wonderful day thank you bye bye, -bye.